Well, good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the Pinellas County Historical Society, I would like to welcome you to the first of our 2014-2015 Speaking of History Lecture Series programs. This is a program that is put together with the assistance of Pinellas County Historical Society here at Heritage Village. When we look at Pinellas County's history, we also have to look at the history of another peninsula, a peninsula of which Pinellas County is a part, which is Florida. You know, there are a lot of Southern historians who will talk about whether Florida is truly Southern. And, you know, they, also, they used to always say, the more North you go, the more South you are in Florida. Well, when we look at the history of Florida during the mid and late 20th century, an important chapter of that is, of course, the Civil Rights Movement. And the Civil Rights Movement comes to places such as Tallahassee, Miami, throughout the state. There are important chapters in the Tampa Bay area's civil rights history that also are very worthy of scholarly discussion. We're going to learn some important chapters that happened within Pinellas County in St. Petersburg in just a few moments. The person who's going to guide us on this trip back to the past, and again, 50 years ago this past summer was when the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed, a federal act that in many ways was a death knell to some of the segregationists and some of the earlier attempts within the Deep South to keep segregation alive forever. To talk about the chapters that happened in this very volatile, very busy time of St. Petersburg's history, we are very fortunate to have Peyton Jones. Peyton is a native of Clearwater. He attended schools locally and went off to the University of Florida where he earned his bachelor's degree in history. He came back into the area and finished a master's degree in liberal arts in the Florida Studies program at USF St. Petersburg. His master's thesis focused on civil rights activities within the city of St. Petersburg. He has since gone on to Tulane University in New Orleans, where he is now in the final stages of completing his doctorate, looking at the larger issues related to civil rights and really the social and cultural history of Florida and the, specifically the Tampa Bay area, of which the civil rights stories are a major part of the equation. It is my honor to bring our first speaker of the series for this fall, Mr. Peyton Jones. Hello, can you hear me? All right, thank you, Jim. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. And I'd like to thank the uh, Pinellas County Historical Society, who a few years ago gave me a very generous scholarship to help me complete the research for this project. Uh, today, I'm just going to discuss a little bit of the early civil rights movement in St. Petersburg, really the late 50s and early 60s, and sort of looking at the integration of the public sphere. Uh, mainly lunch counters, and of course I'm going to begin with Spa Beach in St. Petersburg. In August 1955, black civil rights activists in St. Petersburg, Florida, waded into controversial currents. Ten members of the Civic Coordinating Committee, a prominent black civic organization, approached the racially segregated Spa Beach and Pool Municipal Swimming Facility and attempted to pay their way in. The cashier refused to let them in and called the police. The members of the Civic Coordinating Committee were told to use their own beach at South Mole. The standoff ended without incident. Two months later, after petitioning the city for public use of spa and getting no response, the Civic Coordinating Committee filed a lawsuit setting a violation of equal protection under the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. Thus began a nearly four-year struggle to integrate spa, beach, and pool an effort that also ignited a movement to end racial segregation and inequality throughout the city. The efforts to integrate SPA were, quote, no spur of the moment, explained J.P. Moses, the president of the Civic Coordinating Committee. Indeed, controversies surrounding beach access for black residents stretch back nearly 40 years. In 1916, St. Petersburg Mayor Al Lang granted black residents a strip of beach on the south side of the city that eventually became known as South Mole. White residents protested. Later, in the 1930s, as Jim Crow laws tightened, whites began lodging complaints about blacks traveling through white neighborhoods to get to the South Mole Beach. In 1955, when the members of the CCC, as the Civic Coordinating Committee was known, state, when they staged their first swim in, South Mole, a dingy strip of beach at the foot of First Avenue South, with no lifeguards and no bathing facilities, stood as the only place along St. Petersburg's 45 miles of coastline for blacks to legally swim. The swimming occurred in the wake of, and indeed made possible by, the 1954 Brown decision outlawing racial segregation in the nation's public school system. 
NAACP branches throughout the state encourage black residents to use their tax-supported municipal facilities. Why use beaches of your own when you have a beach that your taxes are paying for, proclaimed NAACP attorney Ray Chisholm. While state and local officials work feverishly to thwart public school integration, black Floridians across the state, from Delray Beach to Daytona, Miami to Sarasota, began testing the legality of segregated beaches. The members of the CCC that led the first swim in did not necessarily care about swimming at Spa Beach or at the pool. They conducted the swim in, in the words of physician and civic coordinating committee member Fred Alsop, to lay the groundwork for legal action. The unexpected breach of racial etiquette elicited a streak of white hostility. In the days following the first swim in, a group of local segregationists met at City Hall, yes, in the halls of local government, and formed the White Citizens Council. The White Citizens Council sent letters to restaurants and businesses downtown, urging merchants to, quote, uh, to not help integrate the races. However, the fiercest opposition to integrating Spa Beach and the pool came from man uh, city manager Ross Windham, who condemned the swim in and su suggested black residents should be happy with what they had been provided with at South Mall. While opposition to integrating Spa was strong, widespread, and somewhat organized, it could do little in the face of juridical change. In November 1955, nearly a month before the Civic Coordinating Committee sued the city, the U.S. Supreme Court had banned segregation of public facilities in Maryland. The ruling affirmed a Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals decision regarding a case in Baltimore that had determined the city had no right to bar any tax-paying citizen from public-supported places. In December 1955, in Alsip v. St. Petersburg, the Civic Coordinating Committee sued the city of St. Petersburg for access to Spa Beach and Pool. In court, lawyers for the city merged law and economics, arguing that the beach and pool operated on a proprietary basis, and that allowing black residents to use the facility would damage its ability to turn a profit. According to the city, the spa was intended to make money uh, Excuse me. The spa was intended to make money, which differ differentiated it from the Baltimore case. But the federal district court disagreed. In ruling in favor of Alsop, Judge George A. Whitehurst explained, quote, the capacity in which the city operates its swimming pool and beach is immaterial. On an appeal, a three-judge panel of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans upheld the, city, the lower court's decision, stating, quote, it is no answer that the beach and pool cannot be operated at a profit on a non-segregated basis, and that the city will be forced to close the pool. Unfortunate as closing the pool may be, that furnishes no ground for abridging the rights of appellees to use without discrimination on the grounds of race, so long as it is operated. The U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear the case, and in April 1957, the district court ruling became official. Despite the legal victory, black beachgoers and swimmers stayed away from spa for nearly a year. The goal had been to integrate the facilities peacefully and rather quietly, so as not to draw too much negative attention to the city. This strategy of cautious, some would say even conservative protests, would become a hallmark of the local civil rights movement in St. Petersburg. Black leaders at the CCC and later at the revived NAACP most of whom hailed from St. Petersburg's small but thriving black middle class, had a stake in maintaining social stability, much like their white peers. Like those at uh, Spa Beach, later desegregation efforts at the lunch counters at Webb City and other department stores, which I will discuss later, as well as the efforts to integrate local movie theaters in 1962 and 1963, occurred in a similar fashion. Small scale public protest, possibly a lawsuit, to get the city to the negotiating table. Even if the city dragged its feet for a time, St. Petersburg, unlike many other cities throughout the South, never had long sustained public protests. Well, that is until the 1968 sanitation strike, which I will say a bit more about later. While Alsa v. St. Petersburg winded its way through the courts, the Civic Coordinating Committee began negotiating with city officials over desegregating public buses. In Alabama, Months after the initial swim in St. Petersburg, civil rights leaders had begun what became known as the Montgomery Bus Boycott. Largely credited with kickstarting the post-World War II civil rights movement in the United States, 
in introducing the country to a young black pastor by the name of Martin Luther King Jr. The Montgomery bus boycott secured an injunction against segregated bus seating policies in Alabama. Months later, in an oft-forgotten boycott in Tallahassee, the, the state capitol was rocked by protesters hoping to integrate the local buses. Hoping to avoid such a scene in St. Petersburg, Ross Windham and members of the CCC, including Reverend Enoch Davis, negotiated an end to the segregated seating policy. The dormant spa controversy awakened in June 1958 when eight black teenagers and college students purchased tickets to the beach and went swimming. Word spread, local media rushed to the beach, turning the minor incident into somewhat of a major spectacle. The swimmer stayed only 30 minutes, but it was long enough, too long for city manager Ross Windham. While journalists reported that no white beachgoers seemed to care about the black patrons, Wyndham ordered the facility shut down. For three days, police officers kept people out of Spa Beach. Wyndham reopened the beach only to shut it down a day later. Following the incident, the city council voted to permanently close the facility. If Spa was no longer operated by the city, indeed if it was no longer open to the public, Wyndham and the city council could still technically win the battle for Spa Beach and Pool. Moreover, the city council, as if its members' heads had been buried in the sand for the last three years, announced it had allocated $15,000 for the construction of an all-Negro beach in the northernmost part of the city, along the Gandhi Causeway, in an area outside of the reach of most of the black residents in St. Petersburg, most of whom did not have an automobile. While it might seem inconceivable today, across the state and throughout the South in the late 1950s and early 1960s, municipalities rushed to live up to the equal part of the segregationist doctrine, separate but equal. In a rear guard effort that misread the writing on the wall, particularly in light of the Brown decision and other federal court rulings outlawing racial segregation in the public sphere, politicians and unelected city officials across the metropolitan area tried their best to forestall racial integration. In Tampa and St. Petersburg, residential real estate developers built segregated residential communities so as to prevent residential encroachment in white neighborhoods. In the 1940s, the state had tried to equalize public school funding for segregated black schools. These are but a couple of examples of broader strategies throughout the Bay Area and throughout the state to thwart meaningful integration. As summer ended and students returned to school, Ross Wyndham quietly reopened SPA in early 1958. A day passed without incident, but on September 4th, a lone black teenage girl showed up and went for a swim. Wyndham pleaded with local black residents to uphold tradition despite the law. Quote, I realize that Negroes through court action have secured the legal rights to use spa, beach, and pool, but we cannot escape from the reality that long established customs provides for separation of the races in recreational facilities. Mayor Burroughs agreed and urged blacks to, quote, cooperate with us in an effort to continue our good relationship. The patronizing and paternalistic pleas fell on deaf ears. Days later, after another swim in, Wyndham permanently closed the facility. What is more, the city council, in a move aimed at punishing the black community, announced it would use the $15,000 that had been allocated for the black beach to build an all-white beach at the North Shore area of the city. By this point, the controversy had begun to draw the ire of influential business factions downtown. Merchants and hotel proprietors worried about racial tensions and the impact a closed beach would have on tourism. Why wouldn't tourists just go somewhere else and avoid the hassles of St. Petersburg? The city's two newspapers, main newspapers, the St. Petersburg Time and the Evening Independent, took different positions. While the Times endorsed reopening spa on an integrated basis, the Evening Independent stood by the city manager and the city council contending that tourists would vacation elsewhere if it meant avoiding socializing and interacting with black residents. Local ecumenical groups pleaded with Wyndham and the city council to reopen Spa Beach. But Ross Wyndham, who once publicly vowed he would not be the person that, quote, integrated St. Petersburg, refused to budge. Later that year, Wyndham and Mayor Burroughs played their final card. Since 1953, the city had flirted with the idea of building a cultural center. 
and it had hired an analysis firm out of New York to survey the best location for such a project. Twice, once in 1953 and again in 1957, the firm recommended that the city build the cultural center at the present location of the Alfred Witted Air Park on a patch of land along the waterfront. After sitting on the project for more than a year, Burroughs suddenly suggested raising Spa Pool and building the cultural center in its place. Several downtown merchants immediately endorsed the idea, encouraging Burroughs, who a year earlier enthusiastically endorsed the Witted Air Park site, to hold pep rallies to garner support. Meanwhile, Ross Wyndham flew around the country conferring with engineers involved with similar projects. Despite Burroughs and Wyndham's efforts, several city councilmen, the Council of Neighborhood Associations, Kona, the St. Petersburg Planning Board, and the St. Petersburg Times all came out against the project. Kona President G. Harris Graham criticized the proposal as, quote, slapped together and called for a 30-day cooling off period, lest the city act impetuously. For much of the opposition, uh, for much of the opposition, the concern was more than fiscal, or excuse me, it was more fiscal than racial or political. When it became clear that a cultural center was too big and too costly, a revised plan called for the building of an auditorium for an estimated $450,000. And since, Graham threatened to circulate a petition to block construction, claiming most of the citizenry does not, quote, want an auditorium. They want sewers and streetlights. Much could have been said for the black community as well. In early November, the city's efforts to prevent the integration of SPA began to unravel. First, the engineering firm Raider & Associates, who was designing the auditorium, uh, quoted the city a figure of $1.2 million to build, to engineer and build the, the auditorium. For people like Graham, support now seemed utterly out of the question. Still, city council members decided to move forward with the auditorium. But a few days later, Ross Wyndham unexpectedly announced his resignation. St. Petersburg's longest serving city manager gave no reason for his abrupt departure. The final nail in the coffin came when Kona issued a petition bearing the signatures of more than 7,000 registered voters, more than enough needed to send the auditorium controversy before the electorate. Before a referendum could be held, the city council aban abandoned the plan. Subsequently, the council voted to reopen SPA with the condition that the city, acting city manager Verlin Fletcher had the authority to close it, quote, should an emergency arise. The beach and pool remained open from that point on. A 160-acre site at the city's North Shore became the new site for the proposed auditorium, bringing a quiet end to the long fight over SPA, and yet only the beginning of the struggle to desegregate the public sphere in St. Petersburg. Despite the victory at SPA, by 1960, the hope of rapidly dismantling the Jim Crow system in the South had faded. Desegregation efforts had met with massive white resistance and a rising tide of race-baiting political demagoguery. While the American economy boomed, disfranchisement in the South and discrimination throughout the country relegated millions of black Americans to the lowest economic stratum. Although the dream of full racial equality had been deferred, Civil rights activists felt optimistic by the passage of two civil rights bills, one in 1957 and one in 1960, and the Eisenhower administration's deployment of federal troops in Arkansas during the Central High High School desegregation crisis. And to be clear, the, the 1959 and 1960, or 58 and 60 segregation, or, uh, civil rights laws were pretty toothless and ineffectual. Such developments legitimized the black struggle and prepared the way for a massive and militant phase. With faith in the legalistic means flagging, the fight moved to the streets. The next phase of the movement began in Greensboro, North Carolina in February 1960, when four black North Carolina a and students conducted a sit-in at the Woolworths lunch counter. Within weeks, the sit-ins had spread to a number of cities throughout the South, including St. Petersburg. Black civil rights activists in St. Petersburg, hoping to encourage city leaders to form a biracial committee, conducted two days of sit-ins in early March. On the second day, Cbet Wimbish, who in 1969 became the first black, uh, the black, first black city council member in St. Petersburg, 
and Gibbs Junior High college student Theodore Floyd sat in at the William Henry lunch counter. J.P. Moses and Reverend Dr. H. McDonald did the same at the Moss Brothers department store. Two identified black males sat in at the SNH Crest lunch counter. In each case, the black activists were refused service and the lunch counters immediately closed. We were told they couldn't serve us because of the existing state and county laws, said J.P. Moses. In fact, the state's legal position gave proprietors operating public accommodations the right to serve anyone they pleased. Unlike the situation in Birmingham and other cities throughout the Deep South, no local or state law existed that specifically prevented white establishments from serving black patrons. More sit-ins occurred the next day. This time, Theodore Floyd and close to 30 other college students took the demonstrations to Webb City, the world's largest variety store. For 20 minutes, the group waited by the turnstiles for what were known as counter checks, access passes to the lunch counter area. When employees from Webb City informed Floyd that the store had run out of counter checks, the demonstrations moved to Cress. The story there was the same. Cress closed its counters and waited for the students to leave. St. Petersburg's first brush with lunch counter desegregation barely registered on the social barometer locally. Everyone, from activists to waitresses to white customers and police officers, remained calm and civil. Business owners, however, took notice. Webb City owner Doc Webb issued a written statement that blamed the sit-ins on outside agitators, common theme within civil rights protests. Webb, who employed more than 100 blacks in the lowliest positions, considered himself, quote, a friend of the black community and believed that demonstrations were condoned by only a few of the city's Negroes. Later, when demonstrations returned to Webb City, Webb once again took a paternalistic posture that refused to acknowledge local dissatisfaction. Despite Webb's naivete, the sit-ins appeared to work. Mayor Brantley had initially balked at the idea of forming a, a biracial committee, saying, quote, there is no need to appoint a committee for the purpose of alleviating a condition that does not in fact exist. But pressure from an interracial group of clergymen led Brantley to reconsider. Quote, it might be well to have a biracial committee to assist in continuing the present relationship and understanding that the us exist, he later acknowledged. The creation of such a committee in Tampa had already led to a moratorium on sit-in demonstrations, and leaders in St. Petersburg hoped for a similar outcome. In November 1960, the NAACP and the CCC planned a selective buying campaigns to protest lunch counter segregation and the discriminatory policies at the department stores. The biracial committee had done nothing. Few people showed up to the meetings and it was rather toothless, much like the civil rights legislation earlier in, in, the, in the decade. And so it was time for black leaders to revive this, the direct action protests. National NAACP Executive Secretary Roy Wilkins had encouraged branches to conduct patronage withdrawals against chain and variety stores throughout the spring. But the St. Petersburg branch did not respond to his plea until November. With the Christmas shopping season already in full swing, the timing was perfect for such a program. An executive committee composed of leaders from the NAACP and the CCC outlined a list of target stores. The NAACP also planned to bolster the campaign with direct action demonstrations that would involve the formation of a youth council. After getting a taste of the sit-ins in March, local college and high school students had grown restless. During the summer, Gibbs High graduate David Isom, fed up with the conservative NAACP leadership, or at least what he considered to be conservative leadership, formed an unofficial youth council and led sporadic demonstrations and sit-ins. Isom left for college in September, and the Youth Council fell apart. In preparation for the upcoming demonstrations, the NAACP formed a, its first official biracial committee, or uh, excuse me, youth committee, under the leadership of Leon Cox, Jr. To the dismay of Gibbs Junior College President Jonathan Rembert, Cox, a political science professor, recruited volunteers from his classes. When rumors leaked of the plans in St. Petersburg, the Congress of Racial Equality joined the fold. The Congress of Racial Equality, known as CORE, it was probably most famously remembered for its leadership and its organizing of the civil of the uh, 
excuse me, so my mouth is parched, of the Freedom Rides in 1961. Just lost my place. When rumors leaked, the Corps', Corps newest Florida chapter formed in the living room of Ike Williams, one of St. Petersburg's few black attorneys, during a meeting between CCC officials and Corps Field Secretary Richard Haley. Although a significant force in movements in Miami and Tallahassee, Corps struggled to gain traction in St. Petersburg. As much as the white establishment, black leaders resented encroachment from outside organizations. After its formation, Corps joined the selective buying campaign in a limited capacity and, along with the Youth Council, supplied the bulk of the demonstrations for the direct action protests. To spread the word and garner support for the, support for the upcoming campaign, the NAACP held rallies at churches and vacant lots throughout the community. On November 7th, or November 27th, the patronage withdrawal began, followed days later by direct action protests. On the first day of demonstrations, there was a buzz around Gibbs High. I remembered one volunteer. Who was going? Where was everyone meeting beforehand? Around 5 p.m. on December 2nd, 1960, close to 30 protesters picketed Webb City and another 15 demonstrators waved signs and passed out handbills at Moss Brothers. Inside Webb's, protesters sat in, in at the lunch counter. In front of counter closed signs, next to white customers sipping coffee, black bus boys collecting dirty dishes from white patrons, Theodore Floyd of Corps and, and NAACP Youth Council President Ted Lockhart were denied service. That evening, picketers targeted white-owned liquor stores in the black community, protesting discriminatory hiring policies. For three days, demonstrations continued. Although picketers heard of the occasional racial epithet, they received little in the way of physical affronts. Waitresses at the lunch counter refused to serve the black customers, but never asked them to leave and did not make a scene. At one point, the police got involved when several sign-toting youths burst into the doors of Webb City. In a deposition taken later, Doc Webb claimed that the picketers, quote, shoved and jostled customers and threatened black employees with bodily harm. One man in the melee, Jack Morrison Jr., went to jail for blocking the entrance of Webb's and for letting customers pass, or for not letting customers pass. On another occasion, former Ku Klux Klan wizard Bill Hendricks arrived in St. Petersburg pulling a trailer with signs depicting, quote, Negroes in Africa and the words, get out of town, written on the side. An outraged Doc Webb, however, single-handedly ended the protests. By noon on December 7th, Webb's attorney had obtained a restraining order against the NAACP, and within an hour, the protests at Webb City had come to a halt. Citing the loss of $45,000 in revenue during, the, uh, during what Webb considered, quote, a malicious and violent picketing, the injunction, injunction dealt the selective buying campaign a mortal blow. The demonstrations at Moss Brothers ended the next day. NAACP lawyers Fred Minnis and Ike Williams immediately filed a motion to dissolve the injunction, and Williams warned that the picketing would resume if negotiations failed. Like Doc Webb, city leaders had seen enough. Biracial Committee Chair Dr. Earl Edington convened a series of negotiations between chain store proprietors and NAACP executives that finally led to a settlement. To avoid the perception that outsiders influenced the situation, both sides agreed to wait a few weeks until January 3rd to announce the decision. Of course, this was not the end of the civil rights movement in St. Petersburg. In the 1962 and 1963, Leon Cox, as, as the president of the NAACP, led demonstrations at movie theaters downtown, which was part of a statewide movement. But again, it was less the protests and more really the sort of the backroom negotiating that ended the discrimination policies. But one thing I think before I wrap this up, I, I'd like to remind or at least inform everybody that you know in St. Petersburg and especially throughout Florida, most of the segregation laws were uh, struck down mainly, like I said, by backroom negotiating and, and lawsuits. There, there was not a lot of public protest. And that was because, as I said earlier, sort of affluent blacks and affluent whites had a stake in maintaining social stability because of tourism, because of attempts to 
uh, sort of attract economic development, especially from the north. But also, they spent a lot of time trying to fight for job, uh, or try to fight job discrimination. And that sort of goes uh, unnoticed a lot within the history books that the NAACP was really working hard for jobs. Of course, you, you know, you can, it's, it's okay to be able to shop, or it's great to be able to shop and eat wherever you would like, but if, if you can't earn a living, uh, it, it really doesn't do any good. So I think most important to remember that the, uh, the sort of the, the fight for jobs really came to a head in 1968 during the sanitation strike. A lot of historians see the sort of this is the convergence of, of an integration movement and a labor rights movement coming together in 1968. And one other thing, I think it's really important to, to think about fighting for integration at places like beaches and pools and also restaurants as part of this larger idea of, of the Florida dream, of sort of this post-war uh, American dream where it's about consumption. Right? People were fighting for the right to be able to spend their money where they wanted to. And it was much less, at least on the surface, about jobs, mainly because if you were fighting for jobs, you would be run out of town as a communist. And I think you can see that with the civil rights movement and the early civil rights movement with King at the national level and at the local level, that it was much more concerned, at least sort of on the surface, with integrating the public sphere. So thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Spa is just off the uh, the pier. You know, the the sort of the little peninsula that heads out, that sort of juts out in the water. Spa was right in that area, just by the uh, the yacht club, where today's yacht club is. Mm. Uh, I, yes, I think so, at least a sign, right? I know that there is a civil rights trail in the works, and I don't know if there's any plans for a sign or a, some way of reminding folks that this is at one time a, a segregated facility. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I think reminding people that uh, about, about their history, of course, is, is extremely important. Uh, yes? They did. Many of them got them back, but they were fired. It was about 90% black workforce before the strike, and then by sort of midway through the strike, the city manager, uh, Andrews, he had fired all of the striking workers and hired white employees, white you know, scabs as they were called, and it was about an 80% workforce, uh, or 80% white workforce by the end of the strike. But many of them got their jobs back, yes. But without, of course, without gaining any of the, uh, the raises that they had been promised and that really set off the strike to begin with. Yes, sir. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with Ray Arsenal and his research on the Freedom Riders and the book that he wrote and all that. I had a memorable experience just a few years ago when I was invited to go down to the Carter Woodson Museum down in what we call the black area of St. Petersburg, to talk about that book and all that. And when I got down there in the little museum that had white people and black people in there listening to his lecture, and then toward the end of the lecture, he said, uh, how many of you were freedom riders? And about a third of the audience had been freedom riders. We, we adjourned from there and we went down to USF St. Pete down to the Marine Research Lab where there was a very big auditorium to see the initial showing of the film, The Freedom Riders, which Ray had been involved with a lot. And what touched my heart was after you heard all this stuff and saw all these horrible things on the film that had happened to the people who had been on the buses and all, and the way they were greeted or ungreeted in the communities they went to, he asked, is there, are there any Freedom Riders in here? And there were probably about 10, and there weren't any of, any of you at that meeting, probably about 10 of the Freedom Riders were there. And here was this integrated audience of white people, black people, just all talking with each other, and 
exchanging ideas and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, well, you know, we've come a long way uh, in terms of the integrated society, which we have. And I just hadn't seen that close a relationship prior to that time. Well, I think that's a really great observation, too, about how much more successful sort of the idea of integrating spaces, people being able to interact and sort of rub shoulders in the same facilities, how much more successful that was than, say, efforts for fighting job discrimination. You know, we, we see today that, you know, the you know, poorest Americans are, are predominantly black. And so I think that, you know, and a lot of historians look back now and accuse the NAACP and sort of a lot of the organizations instrumental in the integration fight, kind of accuse them of being conservative and accuse them of, of really taking and, and, and taking the wrong strategy or the wrong approach to fighting racial discrimination and that it's really about jobs and you know what good is it if you can sort of hobnob with white people in their own world if, if like I said earlier, if you can't afford to put food on your own table or food to, uh, afford to send your kids to college or what have you. So no, I mean that's Ray's uh, that, that film's amazing, that book's amazing. He's, uh, he was the advisor of this thesis. So he's, he's been, he was instrumental in the writing of this project. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Easier. It was downtown. But remember, a lot of it was more about the, the sort of fighting the, the, the local customs. They, like, like I said, the blacks didn't necessarily want to sit at the lunch counter with white patrons. They didn't want to necessarily swim at the beach. They wanted to be able to if they wanted to, right? They, they wanted to be able to have the, the right to do that. And so, you know, much like we see today, we're a very self-segregating society. And I think it's, it was more about the, the lawful ability to do that and not be harassed. Um, but yeah, but South Mall, or South Mall and Spa were downtown, so much more accessible. Well, sure, and in, so in St. Petersburg as well. And that's why, again, you know, it wasn't necessarily that, that black patrons needed to shop at Webb's or shop at the Crest. They just wanted to have the right to do that if they so pleased. Yes, sir. I do not. I do not. But I, you know, in the late 50s, the, you know, the Supreme Court ruled that you could not uh, lawfully bar any t a public or tax-paying citizen from public resources or public uh, facilities. And so I imagine that along with the Spa Beach lawsuit, that some of these barriers, yeah, like a domino effect throughout the city. But no, I'm not 100% sure on how that happened. And it's ironic, too, uh, that you know, with all of these efforts that uh, St. Petersburg, Pinellas County, and even Florida uh, was one of the last states to fully integrate its public school system, right? So here we are maybe pioneering the integration of certain areas and then, of course, uh, falling behind in others. Well, Peyton, thank you very much. Thank you.